this week on the Back Table Podcast. There is a big psychological component to this. And when you give a patient a diagnosis of IC, they are going to look it up and they're going to try to figure out how to fix this problem they have. Um, they're reading that, you know, this is it, <laughs> you know, you just got to live with it. And it's cyclical and it can catastrophize, you know, the entire situation. So I think we need to be able to give patients hope and also be able to diagnose sort of the components of this. You know, we know that ICBPS is complicated and there's overlapping circles, you know, for all these different symptoms. So I think if we can just take a step back and just evaluate the patients based on the things that we know, um, and then also explain to them that this is going to be a multimodal approach. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Backtable Urology Podcast, your source of all things urology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. Protect your most valuable asset, the skill and ability to practice your medical specialty. One out of three individuals become disabled during their career. Be prepared by establishing a specialty-specific disability insurance policy from the experts at DI4MDs. They represent all the major disability insurance companies that provide individual policies for physicians. Special discounts are available for all physicians, residents, and the military. Whether you have no coverage or to compare and improve your current coverage or take advantage of the new higher monthly benefit, contact them today at www.di4mds.com. Again, that's wwwdi 4 mds.com or call them at 888-934-4637. Again, that's 888-934-4637. It's Jose Ocha Silva as your host this week, and we have the pleasure to have Dr. Esther Han. Uh, Dr. Han did her urology residency at Detroit Medical Center. After this, she went on to do a fellowship in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery from Beaumont Hospital in Michigan. She's currently a female urologist at Orlando Health. Esther, welcome to Backtable. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So Esther, uh, we have friends in common. You, you did what you were in, in Detroit. Uh, you were there with one of my residents, uh, Omar, Omar Soto. Yeah. And he was doing his, he, when, when you were there, he was, he, he, he was, was doing the fellow. fellowship and then yes. he stayed as an attendee. And so you, Correct. So you met him as a, as a, as a fellow. I did. How, how was he? What, what was your first impression of him? Uh, we were like, is he speaking English? No, I'm just kidding. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> no, no, he was, he was awesome. He yeah. was the best fellow. He was the best attending. I mean, he was always there. So it was Perfect. awesome. No, no, he, he was very good. <laughs> so, so Esther, so, so you have become this sort of a guru here in Central Florida, maybe Florida for, for her. <laughs> uh, interstitial cystitis, pelvic pain. So, so let's talk about that and maybe uh, 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 as me as, as a general urologist and, and, uh, and the audience, see what, what we can do prior to sending that patient to you. <laughs> and so, so, so I guess- Well, I hope to, my goal yeah. is that everybody becomes a specialist in interstitial cystitis and pelvic pain. And it doesn't become this thing that looms over everybody's head. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I guess sometimes it's just the 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 the, the frustration from from our yes. part. I mean, as well as the as the as the patient, patient. Mm -hmm. and the the time that it takes to to hear these patients. Some and that's usually po most of the time the 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 struggle as a urologist uh, to deal yep. with these patients. You try multiple things, and, and you try to go by the AUA guidelines. But I mean, and we know the guidelines. We know there. While you were doing the, the fellowship and now that you're in private practice, what, what, what are the difference? Uh, what, what are the things that, that you've been doing different or, or, or mainly, I mean, are you, do you have the same practice that you had in fellowship? Uh, it's not too different. I mean, when I was in fellowship, our, um, our professors or attendings were in private practice. So it was very much like a private demic setting. Um, so it actually helped me with the transition, you know, so um, having similar resources, um, being able to uh, follow like the same sort of algorithm, so to speak. Uh, generally speaking, you know, 
residency was not like that. I had no exposure to any of this in residency. So fellowship for me was the basis of my understanding for pelvic pain and interstitial cystitis. Yeah, so so, so I didn't know that. So I, I I thought it was mainly purely academic. So so definitely having that that uh, private background setting. So so you're gonna chat a, a lot of uh, a lot of things and, and and help us try to manage those patients to take some some weight off of of your daily uh, <laughs> job <laughs> work. Yes. So 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 let's go. Let's start with, with just uh, the initial evaluation history. What was the first step? How, how do you treat these patients? Yeah. So, I mean, I think everybody in my clinic knows Dr. Hines obsessed about her questionnaires. So I find it really helpful. As you had said previously, some of these patients are very complex. It takes a lot of time to get the information you need. So right off the bat, these patients, when they book an appointment, we send out a, a pretty decently long questionnaire um, and it asks questions regarding UTI history, constipation history, um, prolapse history, incontinence history, and then also pelvic pain history. So uh, I already have um, a general idea when they uh, come to the office because I get that questionnaire before I even walk into the room. Um, so, but, you know, generally you're still looking at past medical, past surgical histories, family histories, or certainly, you know, birthing histories for them. Gynecologically, you know, I, I'm not trained as a, a gynecologist by any means. So for me, it's, you know, how many kids they've had, any complications, um, you know, because that definitely contributes, obviously, to a lot of these issues. And then once they um, come, I pretty much check a PVR on everybody. Um, I was trained in residency with a lot of male recon, too. So that's just sort of the standard for male and female patients. So just to make sure, you know, everybody's emptying correctly, a dipstick. So if they have incontinence, I wait. I don't have them pee first, but then they'll pee afterwards. But, you know, generally at some point they're giving me a UA. And then everybody gets a general uh, urinary exam. So when they come through my door, I mean, not kidney stones, but for this um, particular issue. So I have them undress already. I meet them actually for the exam. Um, and then that helps with the flow. It takes a lot of time if you sit there and talk to them first and then leave and have them undress and then go back. And then you've got to go back again because it's weird to talk to people when they're undressed. So I kind of combine it. So I, I see them first for the exam and you know, my MA talks to them and tells them, you know, we're doing exam first, but, you know, Dr. Hans going to come back in afterwards and talk to you. So at that time, they can either give me a urine sample if they hadn't already, do the bladder scan, that sort of thing. And then I can move on to like, you know, whatever established patient. And then I come back and talk to them about all the findings. And, and when you're doing, I mean, you're doing a pelvic exam on, the, on these patients. I mean, if it's female, you're doing a full pelvic so basically my pelvic exams um, break down to um, external just examination, seeing uh, if their labia, um, you know, are normal, just the normal anatomy. You have to really check for genital syndrome and menopause. A lot of women coming through your door, I'm sure, have it. You'd be surprised most gynecology uh, or gynecologists aren't really treating it. Uh, so I'm looking for labial resorption, meaning that labial menorah is, is gone. Um, any clitoral phimosis, um, which you'll find more often than not if you're actually looking. Same idea as just phimosis, where the clitoris is completely gone. Then I'm looking at the architecture, too. You know, you have uh, a minority of people who have lichen sclerosis. Um, and so they have this paleness to the skin. And, and I will do um, biopsies on those in the office as well. Um, and then just looking in the vagina, you know, looking if there's rugae, if they've lost their rugae, indicating vaginal atrophy or GSM. And I, I check a pH, so I do have a Q-tip. Um, and so I'm checking their vulva because a lot of patients come for vulvodynia. And so it's almost like a clock exam, gentle um, touching. And, and the people with vulvodynia, I mean, they'll jump off the table. Um, it's very painful despite the fact that you're barely touching them. And, and generally speaking, um, I'll then swap the inside of the vagina and I have pH like, you know, litmus papers and I'll, I'll test their pH. Um, if they have GSM, their pH is high, often 7, 8. And then, you know, if there's still good hormones and all that, then you, you'll see the pH is a three to maybe five, generally around three or four. So, so, so you have mentioned multiple findings yes. that really <laughs> the AUA guidelines don't go into those. I mean, because no. a patient with bovadine, I mean, you're, you're not going to do, uh, I mean, uh, Botox won't help or anything like that. So, so definitely right. when, 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 when you're going through the pathway of cystitis, the AUA guidance fall, fall short. Yeah, I do think that they need to be um, just sort of buffed up a little bit more. 
I think there's a lot of things that I'm doing right now before I would even give them a diagnosis of interstitial cystitis, but certainly other people have given them a diagnosis of interstitial cystitis already. Um, but I, I find, and, and the literature will find too, that there's a lot of people who've been given this diagnosis of IC who don't actually have it. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and like, like you mentioned, uh, either the GYN or the primary physician, either that's what you have. Yes. I, I, I think it's just the nature of physicians. You want to be able to diagnose so that you, maybe you feel better or I feel, you know, we, we want to be able to know what the problem is. And then I think sometimes we think that it helps the patient. I, I guess, deal with it better, but I don't think it does because then they go online and they start looking for IC and, and then they're like, oh, you can't treat it with anything. There's no hope for me. You know? So then they go on this cycle and, and, and then that's when I see them. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're doing, I mean, so, so for patients that have recurrent UTIs, uh, uh, do, do you still think that they might have IC or, or going through that pathway? Then you, you take them out of that yeah, you start yeah. like, like like taking patients out uh, of that guide of that pathway based on your findings. Yeah, so I start taking people out pretty quickly. Um, so I've definitely written some review articles and, and book chapters on this, and and I was trained by Dr. Kenneth Peters, who is one of the um, pelvic pain specialists um, in the world. And so when we see a patient, and this is how I was trained, um, generally speaking, you're thinking Hunter's lesion, I see slash bladder pain syndrome or non-Hunter's lesions, I see bladder pain syndrome. Um, so already I'm trying to figure out which category they fall into. And so if they are true Hunter's lesions, I see BPS, um, then they should have Hunter's lesions. And the studies will show that actually men have more, are more likely to have Hunter's lesions than women. And generally speaking, you won't see them unless they're in like their 40s or 50s. So a lot of these women are already coming, um, if they are 40 or 50 now or even 60, they're like, I was diagnosed back in 1972 or whatever. And I'm like, you don't have Hunter's lesions, I see. I mean, this is, it, it's not typical for someone so young to develop Hunter's lesions. So already in my mind, I know I'm going to be educating them. But of course, in the beginning, they're trying to tell you what they've learned about themselves. Um, so you listen and, and you, you try to understand where they're coming from. But in my mind, you know, if they're young, if they're coming to you at 20, they, they really don't have Hunter's lesions I see. I don't even, unless they're like really pushing it or something, I'm not even offering them to look for um, like a cystoscopy with Hunter's lesions because it's just typically not found. But then also you're, you're starting to see their voiding history, right? They're like, oh, I, I can hold it for like three hours. Generally speaking, probably not. I see. I mean, the, those, those true Hunter's lesions I see patients, I mean, they can't. Once that urine like contacts their bladder, they are going to the bathroom, you know. Okay. So I've split it up in my mind. And then, of course, you know, um, if they're not Hunter's lesions, which is, which is the most of the majority of them, um, then we're trying to tease out what exactly is going on contributing to the bladder pain syndrome. So, so usually a patient with, without frequency shouldn't be IC? Correct. Yeah. Okay. And how do you set expectations I mean, I, and I contrast this, I, I guess, with, with overactive bladder. Do you talk to them about possible treatments on your initial visit for a patient with bladder pain? I do. So the remainder of my exam, which I didn't quite get to yet, um, you know, I do examine for prolapse and then I always assess their pelvic floor. Um, so I think you probably remember at um, Florida Urologic, you know, I was giving you some stats where studies have found that, you know, up to 87% of women who've been given a diagnosis of IC in the past actually have pelvic floor myalgia and disorder. And so that's been true in terms of the patients walking into my office, um, you know, assessing their pelvic floor, you know, it's easy. You just break it, the, the pelvic floor into quadrants, you know, assess the obturator areas and then your levator areas. And with just, you know, sort of the same kind of pressure you would do for a prostate exam, I mean, you can definitely assess hypertonicity. Um, I mean, we all know what knots feel like in our back, you know, like you can feel those things. Um, and then on top of that, women will tell you, you know, like, oh, that's really painful. So in, in general, you know, just just the um, the assessment of that then leads me to to like the treatment options, depending on what I find. How do you convince a patient? I mean, let's say you do the pelvic is painful. UTI is, is muscle in nature versus UTI in nature. I mean, so because they come, hey, recurring UTIs. Yes. But, but, it, but it's, Always. So, how, how long does it take to convince them, hey, I mean, you're going to pelvic yeah. floor therapy? Because it's not that easy. 
It, yeah, it's not. And it is a lot of discussion and education, right? Um, you know, you have a lot of providers out there who just base it on a dipstick and they'll, they'll anytime anybody calls in with any sort of symptoms that are remotely close to a UTI, they'll, they'll give antibiotics. And so for me, I make it very clear. I say, you know, when, when somebody refers you over for recurrent urinary tract infections, it's because they, they need help. You know, they're, they're looking at me to help you now. So I make it clear that I need a positive culture before I'm going to give you antibiotics. I don't just dish it out because you call and you tell me. There are studies that show women will grow bacteria one day and they'll clear it the next. You know, it has to do with your hydration status. I, I tend to um, educate them on these overactive bladder symptoms, you know, especially patients who are like, no, but I, I have to start peeing like every 30 minutes, you know, and I'm like, well, this is just your, your pump that's being overactive. And, and really, if you start asking them, a lot of them are like sick of taking antibiotics. By the time they get to you, they don't want to be treated with antibiotics anymore. And they, they are on board with the fact that you're actually checking the culture before you're throwing antibiotics at them. And then when you start explaining to them, you know, how overactive bladder can kind of mimic like an infection, then they start understanding. Um, pelvic floor wise, I always, you know, kind of tell them your pelvic floor is a, a bowl of different muscles. Um, so in your bladder, in your urethra, your vagina, your rectum, they all pass through these muscles. So if there's any dysfunction in the muscle itself, it can lead to dysfunction in any or all of those organs. And I think at that point, they start to understand how everything is connected. And in terms of the, I have patients that say, but, but I get better with the UTI for two or three days. Is there a, a real scientific explanation for that? <laughs> I don't think, I, I'm not aware of any real scientific uh, reason for why an antibiotic will help for two, three days. But, you know, what I can tell them is, you know, if the antibiotic was good for that bacteria, then it should be longer lasting than just two or three days. I really don't think that you're just com continuing, you know, some people are colonized, but, you know, not a normal average person. Um, and especially if these cultures keep showing up negative. Um, and we've got all sorts of different cultures at our hands now. You know, you got the, the RNA and all sorts of things, you know. So, like, if it's picking up nothing, then I don't think you have anything in there. And I think we need to address the real problem. Okay. So, yeah, like, like you mentioned, it's a matter of education. And, and what about, I mean, the, 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 AU, the guidelines, are, again, we're talking about C, but really it's, it's more. Uh, but in terms of stress management, how, how do you tell the patient about that and, and how to manage yeah. stress? Is something you're doing in the office to help with that or what, what do you tell them? No, I mean, I think being in a hospital-based private practice, you realize that you can't do all this yourself. Um, you've got measures, quality measures, quantity measures, everything, right? So you can't do this all yourself. Um, but I think you can also appreciate some of these patients when they come in. You already sense that they're very high strung. And then if you start asking them questions like, you know, do you have flares when you're, you're under stress? A lot of them will realize that they do. So, um, you know, and then what I do to explain to them is I say, you know, some people carry stress in the form of migraines. Some people carry stress in the, in the form of back pain. You know, the stress itself can manifest physically. We know this, you know. Um, some people start, you know, even white coat syndrome, right? They're stressed and their blood pressure shoots through the roof. Like it's easy to find so many different manifestations of it. So um, when, I, when I talk to them about that, then they start, you know, actually thinking about it and they're like, yeah, I think, you know, I am or whatever. And then if they, they are able to kind of recognize it, I encourage them to speak to someone about it. So in the area, I'm sure if you looked, there are um, psychologists, there are psychiatrists even. And so I do encourage them. It's, it's not a crazy thing. It's, it's uh, everybody needs it kind of thing. <laughs> Have you been able to target some of, I mean, some, some people that help in this area? Yeah, I've been able to find a few for sure. I mean, obviously the hard part here in the States is getting coverage depending on insurance. Yeah. But, you know, certainly some private providers have rates hopefully affordable. Perfect. And how about pain management? As, as a urologist, what type of, of medication are you using for? I mean, definitely you need to, to, to define what type of, why you have the pain. But uh, yeah. If, yeah. if it's muscle pain, what, what are you doing for those patients? Yeah. So if it's muscle pain, I mean, I would say um, for the most part, I convince them that physical therapy is their way to go, um, that the pain may get a little worse with physical therapy before it gets better. Physical therapy is something you can't just like throw on somebody. You can be like, oh, physical therapy, you'll be fine, you know, three months later. You really have to kind of explain to them what the situation is. 
which is they're going to be in a private room with a physical therapist who is trained in pelvic floor PT, um, who has a certification for that. And they might be doing internal work as well as external work. So you have to like gear them up for it or else they're like, what is happening? You know, when they first go to their consultation. I do offer to a select group of patients vaginal Valium as a suppository form. I do that mostly if they've already gone to pelvic floor or if I already sense that they're not going to be able to tolerate pelvic floor very well just based on my exam. Not just everybody, but certainly those patients because I say, hey, you know, it can help you um, relax your floor a little bit so that you can get the maximum amount of efficacy from your physical therapy session. There was actually really a huge interest in doing a CBD study when I was in fellowship. And Dr. Mike Chancellor had, I think, written this like ROL in application protocol like 15, 20 years ago now, but the landscape wasn't right. And still, I think it's a little bit difficult to do these CBD um, studies because of the legal aspects of it. We really need to be able to test the purity of everything and manufacture and all that. But you do have CBD receptors in that pelvic perineal area. So it makes sense for CBD suppositories. Um, but certainly, like we just you know talked about just the purity level that you don't know. And obviously, you don't want to be like THC cross-reactivity. It should be a local application. Um, otherwise, there's really no difference in, you know, smoking a blunt or something. So. <laughs> So, so in terms of the <laughs> opioids, and you try to, to stay off the medication and and, and I and don't, just, I really don't. Maybe volume and and, and just if, at some point the CBD starts coming up, then then soon yeah. do suppositories. If it's vulvodynia, that's a whole different thing. But yeah, for actual muscle. So for vulvodynia, what, what, what would you do? Yeah, so vulvodynia is um, so for many um, peri to postmenopausal women, it's it's just a hormone thing. So they if estrogen of some form isn't helpful. Estrogen testosterone um, compound in cream can be helpful. That area is very sensitive to both estrogen and testosterone. Um, so a lot of the local compounding pharmacies, they all have these formulations ready. And so that that works really well. There's also AVG, like amitriptyline, um, baclofen, gabapentin, like compounding that can maybe help in that area. So there's just all different types um, that, that could help. But, you know, hormone therapy is very under, <laughs> I think it's always overlooked. Yeah. And, and even, even when I do the cystoscopy that I check the vaginal area and I see dryness, I, I see tenderness. I started oh, yeah. on, on, on steroids and, and I mean, the, the hormone, sorry. Yeah. And they say, well, let me talk to the GYN. Like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I do, um, I pretty much. I have patients like that too. They're like, oh, I don't want to do any of that hormone stuff. You know, like I don't want breast cancer. And, and I just tell them, you know, there's, it's been studied on tens and thousands of women. This is a local application. It's not going to be um, causing cancer. Or anything. Yeah. If they have history of breast cancer, I'm not doing it just because, just but I mean, <laughs> like, like you mentioned, I mean, definitely there's studies yeah. that it's very localized, that they, it doesn't have any systemic yeah. side effects. None at all. Yeah. If they have, so for me, if they have breast cancer, I still do it. If they have an oncologist they're still seeing, I will have them go and talk to their oncologist just to get their blessing. But I would say most oncologists are like, yeah, that's doing fine. Yeah. So let, let's move, let, let's continue with this trend of IC. Definitely that is not IC, but we'll continue <laughs> call, calling IC. We've uh, already unraveled it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, so let's talk about the second line therapy. Yeah. <laughs> The, the, the pelvic floor, did, were you part of, of establishing a, a pelvic floor therapy at, at your hospital or, or was it already there? Or? No, I, I was lucky. I mean, here we had a pelvic floor um, department already. It's certainly grown quite a bit since I've um, been in practice. Um, it was funny because I was getting PT for my hip and um, I I didn't mean to, but I, I might have ghosted the physical therapist one time because oh, I didn't yeah. get a reminder. <laughs> And he was talking about how they were in a meeting and they were like, we need to start, you know, um, I don't know, discharging patients who don't show up or whatever. And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to discharge our number one pelvic floor referral <laughs> source here. <laughs> and they're like, oh, maybe not her. <laughs> so I didn't realize, but I have definitely um, been a good, um, I guess, addition in order to to boost the pelvic floor physical therapist. So um, in our healthcare system, we have quite a few now, um, which is 
awesome. I mean, I, I depend on them for so much and, um, you know, you have it in your healthcare system as well. Yeah. Um, and even the private physical therapy groups here, um, they, they are realizing it is such a, um, feel that, that that's just like kind of blowing up right now. So. Yeah. The, the only issue that I have is that some, some, um, I will say I'll, they don't want to drive. They don't want to grow up. Usually it, at my campus, they, they don't have it, so they have to go to the downtown or, 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 or close oh, to downtown. Yeah. So, so most of my patients, they don't want to drive. Uh, no, or and that's understandable. It's during the week, yeah. they're, 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 they're working, so it, sometimes it becomes an issue for the physical yeah. therapy. It, it certainly does. I, I always stress to them, though, you know, I'm like, I get it. I have a busy life, too, and I was squeezing in therapy twice a week, and, and you, you have to make time for it. But if I'm telling you that this is the source of the problem, I mean, are you going to tell me that you don't you don't want to try working it out? You're just going to live with it for the rest of your life. If if you don't, if it doesn't bother you, then fine. But I'm assuming if you're showing up in my office that it's bothering you. So at this point in time, I think you need to make some time for it. Um, yeah. And you know, I, I, women. I, I, I we, we see a lot of women. More blunt right? about saying that. Yeah, I need to. S- I say it. Say it just like that. <laughs> I probably reflect <laughs> in my uh, satisfaction scores, yeah. <laughs> but I feel better. <laughs> no, I mean, I, think I, I guess they, they need always to hear want it, a pill. They, they want the magical pill that, that makes do. everything better. Yeah, they do. And I'm like, I don't have one. This is a multimodal approach. It's going to include more than just me. Um, and so, certainly, I mean, sometimes you even have to incorporate pain medicine. You know. And, and other medications like amitriptyline, cimetidine, pentol. I mean, are, are you going that pathway? Are you using them in some patients? Not often. Um, if I do use any of them, I will probably use amitriptyline. I have more experience with that. But I honestly can tell you I've probably started it on you know, less than five people since I've been in practice. Um, and w- I, I found w- what that- type of patient do, do you give it to him, to them? Is it um, generally de- speaking, I would say, so if they have a little bit more of that kind of anxiety driven um, sort of presentation than I might. And, and really, a lot of times it's people who've come to me and they've tried quite a few things already. Um, and so I'm like, well, why don't you give this a try and see if it helps? OK. And, and how about the icy cocktails? Yeah, it's definitely not something that um, is big in my practice. I will continue it if a patient's already on it and they feel like it helps them. So I'm not against it if it helps them. But I mean, the studies show that it, the relief and effects don't last very long. So I don't think it's a very good therapeutic option if you have to come back like every week for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So then we move to the third line therapy. Mm-hmm. Hydro extension. So, so, so there the, the ulnar ulcer resection or fulguration. Uh, who, who, who benefits from hydro extension? Is it just IC patients or, or there's other type uh, of patients that will benefit from this? Yeah. So for me, I only do hydro distension if I'm suspecting there is like Hunter's lesions or picture. For someone who, you know, has this pelvic pain plus um, this frequency, they can't hold very much, then I'm like, well, we could potentially try this, you know, like we can see if what your actual bladder capacity can be under anesthesia. Um, and so I will try it on them, but generally speaking, it's, it's for the people who I'm suspecting, um, have this Hunter's lesion, um, sort of picture. And then, you know, we know that if we treat this Hunter's lesion, they actually feel incredible afterwards. So, so, I mean, so yeah, you will just treat the whole lesion. So, so really hydro extension, probably not a, a, a big factor there or, or a big tool. No. Yeah. So it's similar to, um, bladder cocktails. If a patient comes to me and they're like, Hey, it works every six months, I get my hydro distension. All right. <laughs> well, and, and, and I do have it. a few patients like that, that, that that's what yeah. they want. And if that's what they want, I'm fine with it. I'll, I'll do it because they feel good about it. And Esther, uh, what time will you do a cystoscopy and, or a dynamics? Yeah. Um, so the way that I was trained, we were actually, um, uh, we use it not on everyone like you think you we would. <laughs> so I would say I, I don't run UDS on very many people. For me, um, I mean, especially these pelvic pain patients, they're probably not going to tolerate it. <laughs> I just don't think you're really going to get that much information um, from this UDS study. I mean, most of them are are 
barely tolerating my exam on them. So um, let alone like some nurse sticking catheters up their butt in their in their bladder. Yeah. So I, I don't. Um, I usually do it for uh, if we're moving on to like third line therapies for for like an overactive bladder sort of situation. Um, and, and that can definitely overlap with some of these bladder pain um, syndrome patients. But that's generally when I use it or if they've had previous surgery of some sort um, that could certainly change. Um, yeah, and in those patients dynamics. that have some urinary symptoms, will you start also? I mean, will, will you give a trial of, of uh, anticholinergics to see how, how they feel? Yeah, absolutely. If that helps them, you know, then why not? You know, I talk about it with them that sometimes it's the pain that causes your overactive bladder, but sometimes it's the overactive bladder that causes your pain, right? So we have to disrupt the cycle at some point. Um, so, you know, obviously try whatever their insurance will pay for, but yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then that's probably why I still see bladder pain. <laughs> To try to, <laughs> so, so if I get, get, can get some overactive bladders and, and then Absolutely. treat them, either do the Botox or, 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 or do a, a nerve simulator. So, cause, cause some of them, they, they do improve greatly and, 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 Absolutely. and, and you take away the pain and well, it, it was an overactive bladder all, uh, all along. Uh, yes. but it, it sometimes it's very hard. Just like you mentioned, I mean, everybody tells them, Hey, you have inter IC, you have IC, you have your recurring UTIs. And mm -hmm. they, they, they don't believe it's an overactive bladder. It, and know, also diet. I mean, diet is very important. They, they don't want to do bad diet. Correct. Yeah. You know, you, I've got this, all these patients coming in, you know, you ask them about caffeine and they only think about coffee. They don't think about the iced tea they have at lunch. They don't think about the Mountain Dews. They don't think about, you know, the iced, like whatever drinks that they have, you know. And so I, I agree with you. I mean, 100%. The recurrent UTIs, the OABs are missed so often in, in this group of patients. It, it takes time to tease it out. And I think a lot of people don't have that time and they don't um, take that time. But certainly, I think you've seen it. I've definitely seen it. Um, you know, you, you treat their OAB, you treat um, it with whatever format and, and they feel 100% better. You know, it makes sense though. If you have a patient with a stent in, you know, they have bladder spasms, it's painful. Um, you know, you, we've all seen it with neurogenic bladder, with those bladder contractions, they're really powerful, um, bladder contractions. I mean, how many times do you have stents come back, you know, to the ER because they're in so much pain from the discomfort. So if they're having this intense overactive bladder, it can lead to quite a bit of pelvic pain. Yeah. I started doing, uh, that I saw it at the Florida Urological, doing Ditropan, time solosin yeah. for every stent. Yep. Uh, let's see. Me let's too. Let's see. <laughs> If, 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 yeah, if we can get a few not coming from the to the ER again, that, that's that's awesome. Absolutely, I've recently started using a little Robaxin, and that that I feel like has helped probably just with sleep in general. It's a muscle relaxant, but at the okay. same time, um, you know, I think that's what keeps people up sometimes. And if they went to sleep, then they would be a lot more comfortable. So um, I've been prescribing a little more Robaxin. I haven't tried it yet in my pelvic pain patients, but it might be something to try out. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I have one patient that she comes just to get a cyclopensaprine and to, for, for nighttime. And, and she's, because supposedly in her case, the, the, the pain is at night only. So, so you know. <laughs> yeah, if it works. If you it, know. Yeah, it works. I mean, yeah. yeah. I, I I, I'm probably going to get arrested or something for prescribing all this <laughs> muscle relax and all this stuff, but. Who knows? Probably not. I don't know. I don't think. I think we're still small fish out there. <laughs> I guess. I guess. Let's see. So, so yeah. moving to the fourth line therapy. I mean, do you think Botox, interesting axonics, if it's pure IC, do you think it works, or, or really you just treating overactive bladder? That's so hard to say, you know, um, because my algorithm is so different the way that exactly, I was, yeah. I'm so, taught. So, so we already so, know it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, for me, that I just see it differently. I, I think certainly um, you're probably going to, there's there's overlap. And so you're probably treating that that overactive or latter portion uh, of it. But, you know, so where I trained, we did pudendal um, neuromodulation as well um, for pudendal pain. And you can see some improvements in pain with neuromodulation because of just the way the nerves feed into each other. For me, I do offer a, a neuromodulation device for pudendal neuralgia itself. That's separate from your, your sacral neuromodulation devices, but there, there is overlap for sure. 
So uh, that, I think how that's does that work? I, yeah, I haven't heard of the pedendal. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So Stimwave is the company that I work with, and I don't know if there there are any others, honestly, because that was the only one that I was available. Uh, that was available for us in, in fellowship for pedendal neuromodulation. So when I was in fellowship, we actually did it um, like transluteal um, to go up into to Alcox and, and hit the pedendal nerve. However, since I graduated, Dr. Peters changed it into sort of like a um, through the posterior portion of the gluteus. So I had to actually like go through and, and read about it and, and do it. I've done it once on a patient so far. Pedendal neuralgia itself, um, it needs to be diagnosed first. However, um, I, what I wanted to bring up was that just sacral neuromodulation itself, the way that you do it, can certainly overlap, you know, and, and help these patients. But yeah, I mean, there, there are different neuromodulation devices that you can place for pedendal neuralgia. And how would you diagnose that pedendal neuralgia? Yeah. So there, there's like a NANCE criteria, uh, essentially. Um, so pedendal neuralgia patients, I mean, you usually know when you, when you go in a room, they can't sit. <laughs> it hurts a lot when they sit. So often they're kind of shifting, you know, that they might stand during your visit. Um, and they'll tell you, you know, they can't sit for long periods of time. It, it, it should get better if they sleep or lay down. They shouldn't be woken up in the middle of the night. For all these patients, um, you know, I do, you have to do a block on them. And if they improve a pedendal block, um, then certainly that points in the direction of, of pedendal neuralgia. And if you can't do a pedendal block, you know, you can always get your um, pain specialists, um, uh, colleagues to do it. But I do it trans, either transrectally or transvaginally. Um, so I think we also tend to forget that there are a lot of male pelvic pain patients out there who, uh, you know, sometimes show up in terms of like, or calja or something, but there there is quite a bit of pelvic pain component to it. Yeah, so so now, I, now that you mentioned it, I mean, I think a lot of prostatitis could be put in the neuralgia because I, I that page I, you have described that patient that cannot sit. Every time they mm -hmm. sit, that they have pain. The more they sit, so. Yep. Yeah. So you might have oh, a lot of put in the neuralgia patients. I, I mean, so. there is. I mean, what is it? The the cat whatever the classification, the third one, 3B, right? I mean, that's just your non-bacterial prostatitis, which is essentially like chronic pelvic pain. Um, and I've seen quite a few of those patients and the pedendal blocks have worked on them. And they actually have a lot of overactive bladder sometimes too. So yeah, so so I well, I, I try to, to if, if they start talking about the, the urinary symptoms, I try to focus on those and, and go from there. And then if not, yeah, try to refer it. I mean, I, I probably won't do... Uh, Virginia, things like that. Uh, <laughs> no, come on. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I'm going to have to go to your office and see what you do. <laughs> Nothing, just the Q-tip test and then I, start the some hormones. It's okay. <laughs> well, I'll do it with the sister coke and if, if they jump. <laughs> you know what? Anything you can do to just fit it in, right? I mean, I think it's about trying to just add a little bit of something into your exam to get the most out of it, right? So, I mean, I don't expect everybody to go into that much detail. Certainly, I get referred a lot of these patients, but I'd hate for all these patients to have to go through their ringer before they have their actual issue addressed. You know, I, I mean, I'm shocked all the time, you know, how often these patients are, are literally just told like, oh, here's an IC, here's an Elmeron, and then they, they like don't want to see him again, you know? Yeah, uh, and, and, and like you mentioned, I mean, so, so I, I, I remember doing cystoscopy or trying to do a cystoscopy and the, the, the woman just jumps. It's so painful and just by, by touching the area. So maybe. Yeah, so that's, I never really start with cystoscopy. I don't, it doesn't, doesn't make sense to me if they're really true, like, you know, pelvic pain patients. I mean, they're just not going to tolerate it. So um, yeah. I, I usually encourage everyone to, to go through a round of physical therapy. Yeah, I'm going to try the, the QT test first. So then, I mean, and, and so then in the, in the pathway, the guidelines, uh, you have the fifth and sixth line therapy. I, I have not gone beyond the four. Cyclosporin A, is that something that, that, that you've seen in private? I mean, when, when you win a fellowship or? Yeah, so there's there's been... I don't know, maybe a handful of patients that I've seen on cyclosporin and none since I've been in practice, but definitely as a tertiary referral center at Beaumont, 
But that's for your hunter's lesions, really. I mean, we didn't use it on or anybody but hunter's lesions. And that's for those with these recurrent ulcers that, that just keep coming back and, and can't, um, you know, there's no way to like kind of suppress them. And so I want to say maybe like three patients that I saw um, in, in fellowship. Whoa. So it's your white whale. Like your hunter's lesion is really your white whale. I mean, I remember actually speaking of Omar, he texted me one day. He was like, I saw one. I finally saw one. And yeah. <laughs> he sent me a picture of it, you know? <laughs> so it, it's something that when you see it, you're like, yes. Like I tell my patients all the time. I'm like, if you have hunter's lesions, I am celebrating right now. Because <laughs> that is the easiest path we'll go down. <laughs> yeah. It's usually just bullous edema or something like that. It's not a whole nurse lesion. <laughs> nope. It's usually uh, glomerulations. It's, exactly. it's anything but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they've been diagnosed in the past. And, and that's something to kind of bring up. I think a lot of these patients have been diagnosed in the past based on this uh, group of definitions that has since evolved. So gl glomerulations itself is not a diagnosis of IC. Um, they've done plenty of studies. I mean, your radiation cystitis patients, you know, your prostatitis patients, all sorts of patients will show up with glomerulations. Um, and, and they don't have any of these IC symptoms. So. And you mentioned earlier that you do sometimes biopsies of, of the external genitalia. Uh, what are you looking for? Yeah, so the, I really only do that if I start noticing different um, architecture, you know, or, or um, coloring. So if you have this pallor and they're describing this pain and, and itching all the time, and it's just like very dry. It's, it's lichen, you know, and so you just have to be able to biopsy. And I just do a punch biopsy. I mean, it's super easy, three millimeter, five millimeter, whatever we have in the office, honestly, I can't remember, but, um, and send it off and, and they'll diagnose it. And then they have to be put on steroid cream, you know, um, you also can find lichen planus. Um, and so there's a lot of different sort of, um, skin autoimmune disorders that you can find, um, and putting those people on steroids makes all the difference. Like I had a mail carrier, she came to my office and she's like, she's had so many like different kinds of creams and whatever prescribed to her by her GYN, but not like a, an actual um, like steroid steroid. And so when I looked one look and I was like, yeah, you definitely, you have, you have lichen, but we have to obviously get some tissue. And over time they're, they're in shortest, like it just narrows it and their labia will fuse. I mean, it, it becomes it really affects their quality of life if we don't stop it now. You know, they definitely can't have intercourse anymore. Um, like in plainness, we'll just kind of like close the vagina together. So it is something that I've seen at least probably five patients um, that I've diagnosed since then. And, and those patients show up usually with, with pain? I mean, what was the, the no, do they, do they, they have should... urinary symptoms also or, or, or just yeah, pain? I mean, I would say... They may or may not. I mean, the age group itself, they it lends to having OAB for sure. But okay. generally speaking, it's more of like a vaginal uh, discomfort, um, pain, burning, you know, and their tissue is real thin, like you, you can tell. And those, because I do have patients that the pain is when the urine goes through the, that area. And and yeah. so, so and then, you know, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's nothing within the bladder. It's something external. Correct. Yeah, uh, for sure. But and I mean, I, like, yeah, I, hopefully you start them on some hormones. <laughs> exactly. So that's what I do. Yeah. So I, I, I hardly, I, I don't use Clobeta. So I, I, yeah, I, I use two hormones because yeah. I, but, but yeah, I'll, I'll start looking for licking and then send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I have no problem doing that. Yeah. Okay. I'm so, just down so, the street. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so then, and then we have, we, we moved to the six line therapy, which is the urine yeah. vibration. I mean, did you did some in, 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 in training? No, where, where I did my fellowship, um, I would say down the street from us, U of M, they did most of those. <laughs> so we did not um, do a lot, if any, honestly, um, cystectomies for this, not to say that it shouldn't be done. Um, there's certainly uh, some patients who need it. Um, in fact, um, one of our previous um, partners, I guess, Rivera, who's now with us, Dr. Yeah. Rivera, but just um, called me about one. Um, and I haven't seen her yet, but he's like, I think she's tried everything, but she wants um, her, her bladder out. And obviously, you know, I'll, I'll talk to her and see. He was just like, can you just make sure she's had everything possible? Because it is, it is in stage last resort. Just because the bladder comes out doesn't necessarily mean the pain's going to go away. I mean, we we know this with other things, you know, phantom limb syndrome. Like, I mean, it doesn't mean it's going to go away. 
Because, yeah, because, I mean, maybe it's, it's the same patient I saw. I saw a patient a long time ago, and she came <laughs> for that. She wanted her bladder to be taken. Yeah. Hey, no, no. So then <laughs> she she went to see uh, another uh, a Euro guy. And so, I, so, yeah, I haven't seen her, like, in a, a year and a half or prior, prior to the COVID. Uh, but yeah. maybe now she's she went to, to Rivera for that, and now... So, so maybe. I don't think she has IC. I think you, right. you probably diagnose her with something else, but... Uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll see. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that it, it's definitely, um, you know, I remember asking Dr. Peters that and he was like, yeah, there's been a couple, you know, and they, they've done really well. Um, but it's a counseling session for sure. Yeah, that's a lifestyle gene. And in those patients, the diversion is enough or you had need to remove the bladder? Or it depends. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would I would think that you would have to remove the bladder for it. Mm -hmm. um, that's, but again, I haven't done it. So. Yeah. I, I don't know who, who, I have a patient I saw, I think like a month ago, uh, recurring, but this, I mean, completely different patient, Com uh, recurring UTIs. He's now in dialysis, but mm -hmm. that bladder was white. So at yeah. some point he's, yeah, I don't, I, yeah, I don't think it's good for, for him to have that inside him, uh, but not sure what happened with him. But, you know, it's so interesting because, you know, I, I'm sure you see it too. I have so many radiation, post-radiation bladders and, and they do, they, they look white. I mean, they're, they're very. So, um, y so, yeah. So imagine, have you seen one of those uh, post-radiation, but the old radiation that was more and more, uh, usually uh -huh. for cervix, I have seen that in the past. Yes. It turns, but, so the, but he didn't have any radiation. He didn't have anything. So, so yeah, he started having just the hospital that called me said that he had hot dog urine, hot dog water urine. So, you know, the, 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 what does the, that mean? So, yeah. So what the, he meant was, you know, the, when they cook the, the hot dogs in this, in the, the carts. Oh, that juice. It's like, yeah, the juice, like, like, like whitish. Yeah. And it, it looked exactly like that. It was just putting white stuff. They, they, they were looking for a fungal infection, but when I did cystoscopy, yeah. everything was white. So I, I, I still don't know. I, the white first meaning I like that. debris or the, the tissue? The tissue. Oh, uh, yeah. So, see, the debris, know, so, so the tissue was coming out through, through, through the foley. So, so it looked like, like debris. Necrotic, until, basically. Exactly. Yeah, it was completely, yeah. it is a necrotic bladder. Uh, but I don't know why, yeah. why it happened. Uh, he has hmm. nephrostomy at some point when, when he's cleared. We'll, uh, we'll remove the bladder. You know, I've actually, yeah, I was going to say, I... Um, one, one kind of thing that I keep thinking about is a lot of these patients, it, it's all post-cervical. I mean, it, I, it's post-cervical radiation. I've seen a lot of these post-radiation bladders that are so fibrotic and small. Yet at the same time, these patients are not the ones complaining about pain. Like they're coming to me because they're leaking. Because <laughs> yeah. nothing, you know, everything is just like lead pipe and everything. So, so you, you always wonder, you know, like why they don't have pain. But similarly, it's almost like stents, right? For your, your, um, chronic stricture patients or your chemo patients or your, you know, oncology patients with stents, they rarely complain about stent pain, but those stone patients will definitely complain about stent pain. Oh like, yeah. You know, I mean, these chronic stent exchange people, like they don't need anything for their stents. Yeah. I don't know ever. if they get used to it. Yeah. But, but, but you're completely yeah. right. They're completely right. They, they, yeah. they complain sometimes of, of the UTI symptoms, what, what they call UTI symptoms. That Little blood sometimes or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's super interesting. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what, what I'm going to do with that patient. So Esther, any final thoughts on, on this patient? Because definitely, I mean, I, I guess the, the most important part is don't label them as I see. Mm -hmm. I think that you are right on that. I think that most people, and not just me, but, you know, literature will show that most people have been wrongly diagnosed. And I did bring this up at FUS, but there is a, a big psychological component to this. And when you give a patient a diagnosis of IC, um, they are going to look it up and they're going to try to figure out how to fix this problem they have. And they're going to go on these forums and there's just not a lot. Sometimes um, they're reading that, you know, this is it, <laughs> you know, you're just going to have to live with it. And, and, and it, it's cyclical and it can catastrophize, you know, the, the entire situation. So I think we need to be able to give patients hope and also be able to diagnose sort of the components of this. You know, we know that ICBPS is complicated and there's overlapping circles, you know, for all these different symptoms. 
And really, I don't know if many of us are able to say, oh, this is exactly what caused this versus, you know, like the OAB and the IC, the, the, the bladder pain sort of picture. Um, so I think if we can just take a step back and just evaluate the patients based on the things that we know, um, and then also explain to them that this is going to be a multimodal approach that you yourself, and I'd say that all the time, I, I myself will not be able to fix this pain. In fact, if you do have chronic pain of any kind, I think it's something that most providers would remind their patients that this is going to take more than just one person um, to treat this condition. And also it will take a lifelong sort of thing. You know, chronic pain is, is there. Our job is to help them regain their quality of life. Um, I don't know that I don't go into it saying I'm going to take this pain away by doing this, this, and this, right? I can't guarantee that. Certainly there's going to be flares. There's going to be this sort of like wave um, of situations like everything else in life, you know? So um, we'll get you to a point that you're better. Sometimes they'll get worse, but hey, we you know what works and we'll get refresher courses in PT, whatever, you know, we'll get you back to where you can and live your life again. Yeah, so I, I sent you a patient like three, two or three weeks ago young in the 20s uh, and the moment that I was, I was explaining hey, it might be cyclical you might have good because yeah. she, she read it she read, read everything but when I told her but I mean unfortunately there's no cure she started just crying crying yeah. so, so, I, so I, I made a note to myself not to mention that again <laughs> That's like telling someone you have prostate cancer and like we can't do anything about it, right? Yeah, I mean, it yeah. really kind gonna, of is. Like, I'm not going to say it's not that again. cancer, but but it it really um, they don't want to live with this pain, right? Yeah. I mean, they want it to go away and to hear from someone like, look, that's it. I don't know. <laughs> you're you're a conundrum, or or the worst thing I feel like people say sometimes is, oh, you have the worst case I've ever seen. You know, like I, it just does not help the situation. Like. It does not help to tell someone like, oh, this pain is the worst and there's just nothing I can do, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, you, you mentioned hope. I guess that that's, even if you're going to not, not, not treat it and send it to somebody else, probably you just keep that there's going to be hope. And because right. I was, I already had mentioned you, but <laughs> I had to say that at the end. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, we, I mean, we all make mistakes. We all say that. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. it just kind of like falls, flies out and you're like, yeah. Take it back. <laughs> I yeah, know. I, I just There's wanted days. to say expectation, but yeah, I, I went too far, I guess. So, so I'm not saying that again. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. This population of patients, there is a high correlation with abuse as well. Um, so I think we have to be mindful of that. You know, there's I think the study was out of U of M. I want patients have some sort of history of abuse. So generally speaking. That's why I think it sometimes takes some time. So teasing that out. Is, and is when you say you're talking about both verbal and physical. Mm -hmm. Or sexual. Or oh, sexual, okay, okay. Yeah, so. Is, is um, that something that, that, that you ask them directly or, or, or you just let the flow, the conversation flow and, and see where, where it takes you? I, I do. I ask them directly, um, especially if I am suspicious of it. Um, generally speaking, you know, of course, my interaction with patients will be a little bit different as a female. Um, however, you, you, I think you kind of just sort of start getting a sense just by sometimes they don't even want to like, you know, be examined, you know, that sort of thing. But one thing that I learned from a colleague of mine, Rachel Rubin, who's just like amazing at sexual dysfunction. Um, so she recently was saying that she asked all her patients, regardless of gender or problem, that you're seeing me for? Is there anything cultural, religious, or trauma related that you want to share with me today as part of your story? And I think a lot of it is, it's important to say that because sometimes it doesn't even like register in the patient's mind as being related. Um, and I think that's a, a nice way to kind of phrase it so that you're not specifically asking or, or insinuating anything. Yeah, that's that's yeah, that's a a great topic, and 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 yeah, I never asked that, and he, yeah. and even if sometimes even if they, I mean, if I suspect it, I don't know what to do. 
Yeah. So, I mean, if, if they even slightly open up to you about it, I mean, I, of course, I don't think anybody expects us to be a psychologist. Like I, yeah. I'm not trained to be one at all, but certainly I, I take one step further, just saying, have you seen or talked to someone about it? I have somebody who I can send you to, and I would highly encourage you to do so because I am not trained <laughs> to, to even unfold any of this. Yeah. So prior to asking that question, I need to have somebody to say, I'm going to say it to you. I need to find people in the area that, 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 that really, because even, even uh, uh, sexual medicine, ju just patients that need uh, a couple of advice and, and it's something that is lagging in, in, in this area. It is, it is. And I'm, I mean, I will share with you all the, the re referrals that I send out. I, a lot of these are, are private, you know, they're, they're not employed yeah. by your, your, my group or whatever, you know, so. And it certainly is something that's needed. That's the one major thing I knew when I was going to start um, practice that I needed to start finding, you know, all the people that I leaned on already, all the specialties I leaned on in fellowship. Um, I was lucky at Beaumont, you know, we had the Wellman, Women's Pelvic Health Center there. And so there was all specialties under one roof. You had colorectal, you had um, pain psych, you, you had... Um, physical therapy, uh, you had your guy and you had a femur serologist. I mean, you had everybody under one roof. So it was a one-stop shop for women. It's been sort of a dream to kind of build that here. But, you know, it, it's something that is a work in progress. But meanwhile, certainly, I think, especially in a city like Orlando, if you're in a bigger city like this one, um, you should be able to find those resources. Yeah, and yeah, you you will continue to build the, 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 the pelvic system or therapy and all that uh, and the pelvic uh, medicine in, in, in Orlando. Yeah. Our goal is to be able to see both men and women <laughs> because a lot of times it, it leans towards women. And yeah. so the initiative ends up coming from like the women's hospital, but I'm like, but I'm a urologist. I see men too. So that, that's our goal. Nah, but it's, it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to happen at some point. Yeah, It, it has to. J j just like women are getting more of the disease that men had before is vice versa. So, so, so yeah. So yeah. Uh, I see, I see more prostatitis now. I mean, younger, younger guys with, with prostatitis or prostatitis like symptoms. A so, lot. Yeah. Yeah. But I also think it's, it's a, maybe, maybe it's a, I'm thinking it's a generational thing. You know, men are more likely to speak up about these problems. I'm sure it existed before and I was okay. just like, yeah, suck it up. You know what I mean? And now it's like, no, it's really affecting my quality of life. I'm going to talk about it, you know, which is good. I mean, it, it, I think it's just under diagnosis. I mean, true, true. Well, Esther, thank you for your time. For, thank you for being at a back table. And, and hope to, to talk to you soon about something else than, than I see or, or <laughs> what, 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 I hope everything is clear you... as mud. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, by no means, like you know, AUA guidelines are there for a reason, but I, this is just the way that I was trained um, and yeah, where I did my fellowship. And certainly, you know, I, I think there's quite a few articles and everything written out there in terms of dissecting the phenotypes now of interstitial cystitis and bladder pain syndrome. Exactly. So I'm sure they're going to change something at some point. Yeah, it just takes time, lots of time <laughs> and effort. <laughs> well, thank you, Esther. Take care. You too. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at underscore Backtable on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable is hosted by Aditya Bagrodia and Jose Silva. Our audio team lead is Kieran Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Ishan Sangwan and Medavi Patwardhan. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.